Larry Cole. I think we should still go ahead and get started. So should we do we need to pull the door closed? I mean, no, no, no. It's, I was just checking if there's more people that come in. Okay. I'm, I'm monitoring people. <laughs> All right, excellent. Yeah, hopefully more people show up. Um, so, um, yeah, you've not seen the CBC lunch seminar when the room is literally like jammed with people pre COVID. That's how things work. A little different now. So, uh, I've been asked by Michael and Becca, who couldn't be here today, to, uh, to provide the introduction. Uh, I just found out that we don't normally go through the, the, um, the seminar introductions any longer, but if you're an MBZ uh, representative, then you should have received a message from Carly uh, outlining the, the sequence of seminars that are happening this semester. Uh, I will mention that the, um, the herbarium search, uh, which is a departmental uh, faculty member search as well, is uh, kicking off next week. So the first two seminars in that search are happening on, on Monday and Tuesday. So watch your email for, uh, for announcements. So I'm just going to jump right into the introduction now. So today's speaker is Inga Conti-Jerpy. She's a postdoctoral fellow working in Becca's lab and also working in, with Todd Dawson, which is an interesting combination, right? But it turns out that her research involves the sort of genetic work that Becca can provide mentorship for, and then also stable isotopes, as I think we're going to see today, uh, which is tied to you know, obviously Todd Dawson's real expert in that area. So Inga did her undergraduate degree at Cornell, and then she did her master's work at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, and then a PhD at University of Hong Kong, where she also stuck around for a first year postdoc. And now she's here with three years of postdoc support for the research that she's going to be. Uh, well, conducting here, some of which may be presented today and some of which probably won't be presented today. And so I want, I promised her I'd give her a short introduction. So Inga, <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. I just want to check um, before I get started if my screen is being shared on Zoom. Um, I think um, it seems like when the recording started, it may have. OK, great. It sounds like people can see my screen. So that's awesome. Um, all right, so thank you so much uh, for coming today. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce myself and some of my research to the MBZ and others um, at Berkeley. And I thought about what I wanted to show today, given that I'm a marine ecologist and I'm in Museum of Vertebrate Zoology now. And um, I'm hoping that this will be interesting to everyone and it, it kind of will show the work that I've done in the past and how it's led me to the project that I proposed for my, my uh, postdoc fellowship. And so we're going to start with the ecosystem that I focused on for my PhD, which is coral reefs. And so here we have a beautiful photo of a coral reef ecosystem. And one of the first observations that we can make in this photo is that the water is incredibly clear. And so this is a factor that comes from the fact that these are extremely nutrient limited ecosystems. So they're what we would consider oligotrophic. And so it kind of begs the question, we have these very productive coral reef ecosystems, despite the fact that nutrients are very limiting. So how are corals able to survive under these conditions? So here we have a coral colony. And corals are, as you probably know, animals, which means that they can eat. So here we have several polyps. And so polyps are kind of the individual animals that make up a whole colony. They're genetic clones of each other. And so one colony can actually be tens, hundreds, or thousands of these individual polyps. And the polyps have uh, tentacles that are armed with stinging cells that can capture zooplankton or other plankton in the water column and pass them to the mouth of the center. Corals can also assimilate any organic nutrients that are present in the water column directly from the water. And so both of these are what we would consider heterotrophic sources of nutrition. There are nutrition that the animal can access on its own. But both of these are also quite rare in these very clear, very oligotrophic systems, right? There's not a lot of plankton floating around in super clear water. And any organic compounds are typically sucked up by a competitor right away. So corals have evolved a symbiosis with algae in the family of symbiogenesis. This is an endosymbiosis where the algae is inside the coral coat cell. And these algae can photosynthesize, they can assimilate inorganic nitrogen and other compounds like CO2 that the coral can't access direct, directly and pass the products of photosynthesis to their host. And so this is what we would consider autotrophic forms of nutrition that the coral now has access to as a result of its symbiosis. 
In exchange for photosynthetic products, the algae obtains white waste nitrogen from the coral host. So basically, the coral poops. It can't use those nutrients anymore, but the algae can. And this can actually lead to almost a closed system within the whole biome where the nutrients are recycled between these two partners. So corals have really adapted to this nutrient poor environment by maximizing these pathways, right? Coupling their metabolism with a partner so they can access as many resources as possible. But we can make another observation about this system. And that is the incredible amount of diversity that's present in this photo. There's probably hundreds of coral species in this one photo alone. So despite the fact that corals occupy less than 5% of the sea floor, they, coral reefs, they account for a quarter of global marine biodiversity. So this is kind of begs the question, uh, how do that, you know, ecologists are super interested in, how do we get coexistence of so many species within one ecosystem? So of course, the first explanation is good old fashioned niche partitioning, right? That we've all heard about. And very briefly, this is based on the competitive exclusion principle where two species with the exact same requirements cannot coexist. And this applies a selective pressure for species to use novel uncontested resources. And so this means that they have separate niches who can occur in the same environment. The question that arises here, particularly with these extremely biodiverse ecosystems is, can we really take the resources and partition them finely enough to account for the biodiversity that we observe? You know, there are only so many resources that species are competing for. Does this really explain the biodiversity that we see? So the second explanation is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And this is a very popular explanation for the biodiversity that we see on reefs. It's based on the idea that if you have an extremely stable environment with low disturbance, you kind of have constant conditions that certain species are more adapted to and they'll outcompete the others. On the other hand, if you have a lot of disturbance, only those really stress tolerant species will be able to survive. So maximum biodiversity is somewhere in the middle. And I really argue that these are not exclusive to one another. Really what the intermediate disturbance hypothesis is saying is that disturbance can create additional niches for organisms to sell. So the third explanation that scientists have kind of come up with to explain biodiversity is neutral theory. And this rests on the assumption that all organisms in a community are kind of equally competitive and they all have the same likelihood of surviving and reproducing. And when you run, like build a model resting on this assumption and you run it, it kind of generates communities that are similar to what we see in nature. And this is, I think the best evidence for this is really in tropical forests. So when we take a look at coral reefs, so this is a break curtis similarity, the mean break curtis similarity and standard deviation. And these are outputs of what neutral model, neutral theory models would predict. And these are observations on different parts of the coral reef. So some are like a four reef, reef crest, different areas on the reef. And none of them are in line with what the models are telling us. So this is not really a great explanation for the biodiversity that we see, at least in these systems. So this kind of leads me to go back to our first idea, niche partitioning, and think about if, see if we can investigate more fine scale niche partitioning than what we've typically thought about when we think about coral. So often, everybody, the coral community, coral biologist community has kind of treated corals as functionally equivalent in terms of their trophic strategy. They kind of use the equal amount of these two different pathways. But there's some preliminary evidence that corals actually fall on a spectrum that ranges between two extremes. Very high dependence on autotrophy through different forms of mixotrophy to very high dependence on heterotrophy. Um, however, quantifying the contribution of these two different pathways is very difficult. Measuring the relative amount of photosynthate that's passed inside the coral cell or even measuring feeding on microscopic diverse plankton communities is time consuming. And that's why this has really only been investigated in a handful of species. And so we suspect that there's a spectrum of perfect strategy that's very difficult to demonstrate. So I wanted to answer this question, do we see trophic niche partitioning along this autotrophic heterotrophy spectrum using a new tool that was relatively fast and easy compared to how, what, how we previously investigated this in corals? And that stabilizes the analysis. So here we have a biplot which is typically how we look at carbon and nitrogen isotopes. We have our carbon isotope values on the x-axis and nitrogen isotope values on the y. And on this, we can superimpose a theoretical food web. 
So we have phytoplankton consumed by zooplankton consumed by a heterotrophic coral. And we notice that we see some changes in the isotope values as matter is passed from one trophic level to the next. And it turns out that this occurs in a predictable way. So across the majority of organisms and ecosystems, as we move up one trophic step in a food web, carbon is either unenriched or enriched at most one per mil, and nitrogen is enriched between two and a half and three and a half per mil. And per mil is just the unit that we use when we talk about isotope values. So here we can also superimpose what we might expect in an autotrophic world. We would expect a lower nitrogen value because it doesn't have as many trophic steps leading to the coral. And a mixotroph might fall somewhere in the middle. So what we can do is we can go out into nature and we can sample 20 or more individuals of one species and plot them on a bi-plot like this. And we can use something called stable isotope Bayesian ellipses in R analysis or CIBER to fit an ellipse to this group. And this is what we would call the isotopic niche, which is a proxy for trophic niche because of these isotope dynamics that we see in nature. And what we can, would expect is that if we compare the isotopic niche of the coral host to that of its symbiont, in a heterotroph, we would expect niche separation. But in an autotroph, we would expect niche overlap. So this is what I did. <laughs> I also did something called a residual permutation procedure, which can test whether the two groups occupy significantly distinct space in the pipeline. So the present results, you might see some p-values. That's where they're coming from. So I did this work in Hong Kong, uh, just to orient everybody to the part of the world that I'm working in. So here's the South China Sea, Southeast Asia. Hong Kong is right on the southern coast of China. It's a city of about 8 million people, and it has a relatively small land area, but it also has more coral species than the entire Caribbean Sea. So it's actually a fantastic place to study corals, even though it doesn't seem so at first. And so myself and some of my lab mates went to 23 sites across Hong Kong and collected up to three individuals of each genus of coral present. When we looked at what we had at the end, we had seven genera where we had high enough replication to conduct cyber analysis. And what we found was that in some of our genera, we had an extremely high overlap between host and some of isotopic niches, and they did not occupy a significantly distinct space in the bi-plot. We would classify these as autotrophs. <laughs> Other species genera had complete separation of host and some niches, and we would classify these as heterotrophs. And then finally, we had two genera in the middle with partial overlap that we classified as mixotrophs. When we looked at the metrics that we could use generate with cyber analysis, and we said cut off a portion of the host ellipse that's overlapping that of the semi to classify species into these three categories. So if more than 70% or 70% or more of the host niche is overlapping that of the semi it's an autotroph, 10% or less is a heterotroph, in between it's a mixotroph. We also found that the distance between ellipse centroids is an interesting metric that we can use to assess trophic strategy. So in a cropera, the center of the host and semi ellipse are very close. They're 0.33 mil apart. But in platygyra, one of our most extreme heterotrophs, they're two and a half per mil apart. And really, like two and a half per mil is what we would expect with one trophic step. So this is really showing that we have you know, biological relevance in the values that we're using. So we can start to build kind of a little bit of a conceptual model with a toolkit that Cyber gives us to assess trophic strategy. Um, and we are indeed finding that corals kind of fall into a range across the spectrum. And we can use these cutoffs to help sort them into those categories. So can we relate this back to coral biology? So in 1976, this guy Porter wrote a paper that everyone in the coral world references over and over that didn't have any data, but had an idea. And the idea was that surface area was a critical uh, factor uh, determining the, that it's involved in the trophic strategy of corals surface area to volume ratio. And he was like, if you have more surface area to your volume, you can intercept more light and conduct more photosynthesis. So he proposed that branching corals, which is branching colony morphology, had a higher surface area to volume ratio. Whereas corals that are massive, kind of more of like boulder shape, had lower surface area to volume ratio. He also proposed that polyps were a factor in this. So if you have small polyps, they inherently have a higher surface area to volume ratio. But if you have larger polyps, the polyp is where the mouth is. And so the bigger mouth can eat bigger particles. So you can eat a larger range of particles and maybe get more of your nutrition from them. There's some evidence for this in the literature. So this is a paper that looked at 
photosynthesis rates and pulsize in Caribbean Gorgonian. So on the y-axis here, we have a simulation of heavy carbon, which was kind of provided in a way that only photosynthesis could access it. So the high, the more of this carbon that was assimilated, the more photosynthesis occurred. And correlate depth is kind of correlate is kind of the cup that the polyp sits in. Sits in. So if you have a bigger correlate, you have a bigger polyp. And so our small polyp corals had more photosynthesis, and our large polyp corals had less. So this kind of supports Porter's original hypothesis. But it's never been done in hard corals, only in soft corals. So we took a look at the correlate area of our species and our genera, and we looked to see if there was a relationship with the distance between the centroid of the host and symbiont niches. The autotrophs had small polyps, mixotrophs did too, but the heterotrophs had bigger polyps, and this relationship was significant. So we supported Porter's hypothesis, and we can kind of, you know, put this into our conceptual model, like with more certainty and the additional evidence that the surface area to volume ratio is a key trait, a key adaptation to these different trophic strategies. So this was super interesting, but we wanted to take it one step further. And we noticed a pattern uh, among uh, coral bleaching. So as many of you are probably aware, corals can bleach. And this is where, when they're, when they're exposed to thermal stress, they expel their associated symbiote of the AAC and turn bright white. And what we have seen from previous experiments is that there seems to be a relationship between heterotrophy and the resilience to bleaching events. So can you recover, how well a coral can recover from a bleaching event? So here we have a plot that shows that the amount of heterotrophically obtained carbon and how much it contributes to respiration in three species of coral that are bleached and unbleached. And in parietes, there's no difference in how much carbon the corals are getting from heterotrophy, regardless of bleaching state. But in Monticura capitata, this species was able to get way more carbon from heterotrophy when it was bleached. So it's like the coral can compensate for the loss of autotrophic nutrition through increased heterotrophy. Another pattern that has been observed in bleaching events around the world is that certain corals tend to get hit harder by bleaching. So they have higher mortality and higher loss of coral cover. And this is correlated with colony morphology. So these branching species exhibit the highest mortality rates and the highest loss of coral cover in this bleaching event, while other massive species have some of the lowest. So this kind of, all of these data suggest that the resilience that corals have to bleaching, their ability to survive and recover from a bleaching event is linked to their trophic strategy. But there was another observation out there that all, where branching corals also always tend to bleach first. So rather than recovering resilience, I was interested in if trophic strategy was related to bleaching resistance, how quickly you succumb to thermal stress. That was the question that I aimed to answer. So I ran a uh, thermal experiment. So here we have seven nubbins of eight coral species representing our seven genera in their little individual microcosms of water flow in a water bath. And we increased the temperature that these corals were exposed to one degree Celsius per week. And this is the temperature in the experiment. We didn't have great temperature control, but we had a really nice increase in the degree heating peaks. And this is a metric that coral biologists use to assess thermal stress. And it incorporates both the magnitude of the temperature increase, but also the duration. So both of those factors are really important. And so when we considered that, we had a really nice slow ramp in our thermal stress for our corals. So here I've kind of zoomed in on the right hand side of the last figure. And every other day, we would go out and assess the bleaching status of every single nubbin in our experiment with a color card. And we would classify a species as bleached when four out of seven, at least four out of seven nubbins were bleached. And if we look at when this happened, the autotrophs all bleached early on in the experiment. And what was really exciting was that this matched what we see in nature or in the field. So right around four or five degree heating weeks is when we see the earliest signs of bleaching in the field. So that was great. Then we had our heterotrophs. And again, they bleach later, and they also match what we see in the field. So around eight degree heating weeks is when we start to see massive bleaching on reefs where almost everything is bleached. Interestingly, we had one heterotroph that didn't bleach during the experiment, which is why he's awkwardly in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> then we had our mixotrophs. And our mixotrophs kind of told a conflicting story. So Paredes lobata 
right in the middle, exactly what we would expect. But Pavona de Cusada didn't bleach until about 10 degree heating weeks. So we take a second look at this species. So this is the only species in our experiment, and the only species in Hong Kong that has this vertical plating morphology. So this is a field of Pavona in Hong Kong. And you can see it has these plates that are kind of oriented perpendicular to the water surface. So this affects a factor that is also very important in bleaching, which is light intensity. So we hypothesize that perhaps the vertical plating morphology of the species confers some kind of protection against bleaching and that it reduces light intensity to the coral exposes. And this was exacerbated by our experimental design. We had these corals in these little semi-opaque cups with like just a narrow opening and none of the sides of this coral were exposed directly to where the light would be coming in. We looked at the literature and we found this really interesting observation from 2001 with unfortunately a terrible photo. This is another species of pavona that has a slightly different morphology. It's kind of like a table. The tops of this colony are extremely bleached during this thermal event, but the sides are not. And so this really supports this idea that there may be some advantages to having that vertical plating morphology. So we kept this in mind when we ran our statistics. And again, we looked at the distance between the centroids of host and semiot, and compared to how many degree heating weeks when a species bleach. Autotrophs again bleached early. Unfortunately, split story with our mixotrophs, heterotrophs bleached late. This regression wasn't significant when we included Pavona, but when we excluded it on the basis of, morphology, of its morphology, it was. We think this is pretty compelling evidence that trophic strategy is linked to bleaching resistance as well as resilience and recovery. So we can add this to our conceptual model. And this is important when we think about conserving and restoring corals. Right? A lot of NGOs are doing coral gardening, kind of planting corals back into reefs. Maybe we don't want to focus on these bleaching susceptible species. Maybe we want to look at larger polyps, uh, heterotrophic species. So this was an extremely interesting and I think fruitful project. While I was kind of you know, writing it up and thinking about it and contextualizing it, I kept thinking about other organisms that have very similar relationships. Lots of marine organisms associate with the same family of algae. But where to start? And so it just happened that we got a new postdoc in the lab, Ethis Kiver, who's an expert in giant clams. And so giant clams are also associated with the vitamin E AC. And they're also extraordinary organisms. So one species of giant clam, Gygus, can get up to a meter in diameter or over a meter in diameter. Um, and so we were really curious about this. They're also much more phylogenetically constrained than corals. So corals are kind of like a very diverse group. Clams have two genera. Giant clams that associate with the mid and have two genera. So we thought this was an interesting group to target. So we recruited a master's student, Leo Kahn, and we designed a study to answer the question, if we saw the trophy niche partitioning that on the autotrophy heterotrophy spectrum that we saw in corals also in these giant plant species. So Ethis, unfortunately not me, went to the Philippines. She went to Sivarara Island and to a giant clam hatchery. And so here they rear clams from larvae in these outdoor tanks. And when they reach a certain size, they bring them into the lagoon where they rest on the seafloor. So this was a very convenient sampling site because we had five species of giant clams that were all coexisting at the same lagoon. And we were able to take small tissue samples from them for stabilization analysis. And we found a pattern similar to what we saw in corals. So Tridacna gigas, the biggest of the species, had uh, about, you know, relatively good overlap with its symbionts and did not occupy significantly different space in the bioplot. Theresa had partial overlap with its symbiont, and our other three species had completely separate exotropic dishes. Now, this was great, but we had some questions about the cyber analysis that we were using that had kind of come up since we published the first study with coral. The first was that we actually got a comment from some colleagues on our paper, and they asked one of the questions they asked was, you know, why this size of an ellipse? You know, it doesn't encompass all the data. And so these are actually the standard ellipse area, which account for 40% of the variation in the data and one standard deviation on each side of the mean. But we can also look at ellipses that encompass 95% of the data, two standard deviations on either side of the 
we ran that as well. And this was pretty interesting because we saw the value in these larger ellipses. In this case, all of our plans overlap, at least partially, the niche of their symbiont. And really, that probably reflects reality, right? These clams are probably getting nutrition from their symbiont. But we also noticed that the smaller ellipses accounted for differences in the isotope values that were biologically meaningful. So if you have a difference between host and symbiont that's two and a half per mil or one to a good step, that wasn't really getting captured in the larger ellipses. We thought they both kind of had something to offer us in terms of the trophic strategy of these plants. The second thing we were concerned about was in contrast to corals, some of our plant species, the host and semions had very different size ellipses. So if you look at Gygus, the first one here, only 32% of the host niche is overlapping that of the semion for the large ellipses. And that's because the semion ellipse is completely inside of the host ellipse. This was super interesting. It was the same thing as having with Dorosa. Like, how do we account for that? So we Rather than just looking at the proportion of host overlapping the symbiont, we also wanted to think about the proportion of symbiont overlapping the host. So our incredible master student, Leo, developed a new metric that we get encapsulated all of these things, and he named it host evaluation reliance on symbiont, and we call it HERS, the HERS scale. So this is the equation they came up with, but I'll break it down for you so it's pretty simple. Basically, the purple are the hosts, Ellipse, the proportion of host ellipse overlapping symbiont, and it's raised to the, to the exponent of the proportion of symbiont ellipse overlapping host. So we kind of account for both of those variables. And we included both the large ellipses and the standard ellipse areas. This gives us a value that ranges from zero, which we would consider a true heterotroph, to one, which we would consider a true autotroph. And we set cutoff at 0.25 and 0.75 for kind of predominant heterotrophs and predominant autotrophs. And we looked at where our clams fell out. We had one heterotroph, Pumosa, that fell below our cutoff. And then most of the clams were pretty close to the cutoff, kind of definitely leaning towards the heterotrophy side of the scale. And Gygus really stood out as being the only species that had a value above 0.5. So to kind of see if this scale was making sense with what we understood about Plans and corals. We were also calculated the values with the same seven genera from the previous study. And the results agreed fairly well with what we have already assessed. I would say that the exception is that some species that we labeled as heterotrophic was over kind of into the cutoff of mixotrophy. But to be honest, I think that this is a better representation of the biology of these organisms because it's kind of a question we don't really. A lot of coral biologists get upset when we talk about heterotrophy because they think it means there's no nutrition covering the symbiont, but it's really relative. But I think what's nice about this scale is it kind of allows us to say relative to one another, like how much nutrition they're getting from their different sources. We also found three species from the literature that had high enough replication for this analysis, and so we added that as well. What we noticed was that Corals seem to be occupying like a broader range on this spectrum than clams. And we think that this might be related to their structure and kind of their growth morphology. So corals are modular, they're these colonial organisms made up of many polyps. And that gives them extreme flexibility in the structure that they can take on. They can really maximize their surface area to volume ratio if they want, or if they evolve to do so. Um, clams are much more constrained in their morphology, right? So they're bivalves, they have this two shell, and where they keep their symbiont, instead of all over the colony, where they keep their symbionts is in the mantle, in this fleshy tissue that's between the shells. So they can only increase the surface area for photosynthesis to a certain extent, right? And so maybe this is part of why they're more constrained on the herd scale. The second thing that we noticed was that the order of the clams on the scale seemed to correspond pretty well to growth rates. So we ran a regression and it was significant. The first score was significantly correlated with the growth rates published for these species, with T. gigas having the highest HER score and the fastest growth rate. And we wondered if, you know, perhaps the growth rate that gigas has is why it can become so large, right? Is autotrophy really driving this? huge size in this clam. Um, 
This also agrees with what we know about squirrels. So here we have some data from my lab back in Hong Kong where they measured the growth rates of three genera at a single site. And the crabber has a significantly faster growth rate than either of the, the mixotrope or the heterotrophic species that they studied. So when we go back to our conceptual model, we can now add our clams on here, kind of more on the mixotrophy, heterotrophy side. And we can add our herd score as another tool in our toolkit for assessing trophic strategy before the show. And we can also add this growth rate, right? Because I think it starts to show us some of the trade-offs involved in these trophic strategies. So highly autotrophic species under good conditions can maybe grow faster and outcompete heterotrophic species. But when things get stressful, certain stressors come along, they're more susceptible. And we start to see like the trade-offs that are involved here and how these different trophic strategies are able to coexist. Okay, so this was, you know, I, these, I enjoyed working on both of these projects a lot. And when I was writing them up, you know, we always contextualize them kind of in this broad idea of symbiosis and what it affords the partners and, and the role that it plays in the evolution of these organisms. And I was, you know, we think a lot about the diversity of marine organisms that maintain symbiosis, but of course, other organisms also have nutritional symbiosis. So that includes bacterial plants that associate with mycorrhizal fungi. And it's been shown that some species of plants can persist in nutrient poor soils because of their relationship with the fungi. And then lichens are kind of the poster child for nutritional symbiosis. It's a fungus and a photobiont, which can be an algae or cyanobacteria. And they're famous for surviving in extremely nutrient poor conditions, like bare rock face, right? I mean, that's incredible. And so thinking about this work kind of in this broader context and these other symbioses that exist in ecosystems across the planet, I started to notice that certain traits kept popping up in multiple of these groups. So the first was extracellular versus intracellular association. So in corals, I mentioned they have an endosymbiosis. So here's the coral cell, and then inside the cell is the algal cell. That's not true for clams and other marine invertebrates. Here, the cells are forming a tissue layer, the host cells are forming a tissue layer, and clams actually have an organ called the gut tubular system where they keep their symbiont. So it's like more physically distant, right? The same thing occurs in mycorrhizae. So here we have a cross section of a root where the mycorrhizae colonize the plant, and ectomycorrhizal fungi form this sheath around the root, whereas endomycorrhizal fungi or muscular mycorrhizal fungi penetrate the cell wall. Finally, most lichens are thought to maintain an extracellular symbiosis. So we kind of have the fungal part in white, and hyphae wrap around the algal cells in a layer. But some studies that have investigated certain species have found that there can be cell wall penetration. So here we have the algal cell wall in kind of gray, and the fungal cell wall in white is penetrating the algal cell wall. So this does occur in some lichens. And we think that actually the vast majority of lichens haven't been investigated. So it could be more prominent than we currently think. The second set of traits where the symbiosis is facultative or obligate. So coral is a great example of obligate. We know that they can lose their symbionts in stress. They don't die right away, but if they can't reestablish the relationship, they will eventually starve and die. So they really need their symbionts to survive and reproduce. So not all corals. This is Oculina arbuscula. It's on the east coast of the United States. When you look at this colony, the top half is kind of dark brown, orange, and the bottom is white. And that's because even within this colony, the top exposed to light is associating with the Medianiaceae, and the bottom is not. It's it shaded out by itself. We find colonies that are completely white in like shaded areas of ledge habitats or wrecks. So this is a facultative, a truly facultative symbiosis. For fascinating. Vascular plants are also facultative for the most part. So they can live without mycorrhizae and with, they just tend to grow bigger and faster when they have their symbionts. That's not always true. So this is a mycoheterotrophic plant, and it's white because it has no chlorophyll. And so it's basically a parasite and gets all of its nutrition from its mycorrhizae to work with species if it gets off America. Super cool. So that's an obligate. It can't survive without a symbiont. Lichens are not a great group for this, this set of traits, unfortunately. So the mycobiont, the fungal partner, 
we basically only find them in nature in association with their photobiops. And the algae are the opposite. They always exist independently, but usually in less density. Okay, the last set of traits is how the host gets its microbial symbiosis. Corals have both modes. And yeah, so in vertical transmission, the adult colony releases a egg sperm bundle that also has an algal cell. Then the larvae metamorphoses that already has algae that it can start its symbiosis with immediately. But other corals release their egg sperm bundle without algae, and the adult has to obtain it from the environment. Lichens, interestingly, have a similar but slightly different situation. So the fungus of all lichens can reproduce sexually. And this is inherently without the symbiotic, so it has horizontal transmission. So here you can see at the sexual side of this diagram, there's the astrospore, spore goes off, it germinates, and then it has the lichen eyes, and it gets the algae from the environment. But some lichens, not all, can also reproduce asexually, and they create these little structures, these protrusions, that release these little bundles of algae with fungus wrapped around them that can go out into the environment and colonize these spaces. So lichens are another great system that we can look at these two traits in. Plants aren't. <laughs> <laughs> they, interestingly, it seems like all vascular plants obtain their semiots horizontally. So even though they play such an important role in plant physiology, they, there is no vertical transmission. But we can still look at it in these other two groups, kind of marine invertebrates and lichens. So, you know, I was thinking about all of this, and these traits kind of fall into two groups, right? Kind of those where there's like less coupling between the partners. You know, they're physically separate. They don't necessarily need each other. They can get, get the symbiote from the environment if they need them. And then really tight coupling, right? Like, need each other's cells, need each other to survive. They pass them on to the next offspring. So I, I, I came up with a hypothesis that these traits are associated with less nutrient sharing in the symbiosis. And our tightly coupled traits are associated with more nutrient sharing. So my project while I'm at Berkeley is going to be to test this hypothesis across those three groups, marine invertebrates, vascular plants, and lichens. And I'm starting at the Hastings Natural History Reserve. So one of the things I have absolutely loved about working at Berkeley already, I've been here three months, is the history of science that has been done here. This is really incredible, especially coming from Hong Kong, where we kind of there's been a lot of science, but a lot of it we have to kind of start with, start from scratch. And so Hastings has incredible records of what is present there. So this is an example of a piece of every plant species found at Hastings that is available online um, at the Hastings website. On top of that, all the collections that have ever been done there the past 70 years are housed in the University of Justin Hyder Herbaria. So I went to the, the Herbaria database. I cross-referenced it with a couple of other databases on plants and lichens. And for each of these groups, I can collect at least one species from three of the four categories that I'm interested in. So this is going to be my first stop for sampling uh, to head up down pacing and start collecting some of these, these groups and running through life analysis. There's a whole another part of our project looking at gene expression, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk to you guys about that today. That's why Becca is my supervisor. Um, but I'd like to thank you so much for your attention and for coming today, and also to my, my collaborators and collaborators for the two projects that I presented. And I would be absolutely thrilled to take any questions you might have. Um, that was very cool. Thank you. Um, so this might be a question just just based on me not knowing a lot about corals, sure. but is there any um, plasticity between being a heterotroph to an autotroph, or is it something that a species is kind of stable? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the figure that I showed where it was like the bleached and unbleached corals, so obviously some species do have this plasticity. What I think is really interesting is that, you know, I mean, that paper showed that, like, you know, one species could really upregulate heterotrophy, or not upregulate, but increase heterotrophy, and the other species couldn't. So, plasticity seems to be another factor 
that is not the same across coral species. We know some species can change, and they can even change their morphology a lot um, based on the conditions that they're in, that they're growing in, but other species are really restricted and they don't exhibit that plasticity to the same to that extent. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this is Jessica. I'm interested in how uh, you and your colleagues cited the cutoffs for that third scale. And then the secondary question is, could that be applied to interspecific um, relationships that are like like not symbiont and host? Or do you think maybe there's like avenues for that? Yeah, yeah. So so to answer your first question, like how we assess the cutoff. I kind of presented it in the opposite of what we did. So what we did is we kind of like ran everything we could and we're like, these seem reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something that I think a lot of people, you know, the those assessments are kind of, I would say in development. And we're kind of proposing them, you know, as it's kind of like a huge leap forward in terms of our ability to assess corals and other symbiotic organisms and the sharing that they do in terms of what we, what we had before. But it's not perfect. And that's kind of why we're still refining it. So yeah, I think there's those could definitely change. Um, but that's kind of like our stab now. Got it. Um, the second question that you asked is like, could this be applied to non-symbiotic species? Uh, so originally cyber was created to do just that. So and really cyber was created to not look at the placement of niches on the biplot, but the relative sizes. Right, so does one species have a bigger niche, isotopic niche, and therefore you would assume that it eats a wider, wider diversity of food sources. So it doesn't always hold up, but you can kind of constrain that um, in your sampling. Um, yeah, so it definitely can be. Um, people are using like kind of like the overlap metrics as well uh, for other sites, like non somatic organisms, but it's, you have to be a little bit more careful about not overstepping. Yeah, the nice thing about symbionts is that, like, with other organisms, like, they're eating different things, like, maybe they're from different places, but, like, when you have a symbiotic organism, it's, like, the isotope baseline is the same, like, it's the same environment because the partner is living in the same place. So it kind of eliminates a lot of those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Anyone else? Yeah. I was wondering if between the host and the symbionts, I remember that I learned that some of this, the, these relationships, when they get like closer and closer, for example, they lose some genes. So it's more uh, like they, they are forced to be together. So I was wondering if that happens in the coral too, or some gene loss or something that makes them. As far as I know, nobody has looked at that in corals. Um, yeah, there's. Like there has been like some kind of more advanced genomic work done with corals, but it's definitely kind of I would say lagging a little. Um, yeah, I that would be a that's a great question. <laughs> <study that. laughs> yeah, I I have no idea if there's any evidence out there that that supports that or not. Yeah. Oh, all right. In the situation that we like try to replace uh, or propagate more is the ones that are like resistant um, and put them back out there rather than add less receptive to it. Um, in some way, like I know it's like just like coral in general, so like it might be the solution, but is it also kind of going against your kind of hypothesis or idea of like the diversity of this partitioning and the like, intermediate sister hypothesis is what's creating all this like cool biodiversity so that if we like put in everyone that does the same in partitioning and kind of flatten it out again. Okay, so let me sorry. Let me see if I understand. Yeah. So I kind of see like two sides to your question. So the question is kind of like, if you only kind of restore one trophic strategy of coral, will that kind of lead to like less diversity on reef? Yeah, I absolutely think so. But I would also say, I mean, like part of the reason that we see diversity of all the other organisms on reefs is because we have diversity of coral, right? And there's things that are different across species that I didn't touch on, like skeletal density and like just part of stuff, right? But um, we're like in a crisis mode, I would say. <laughs> like, like, so like 
corals are not going to go extinct. Like we have deep sea corals. We, like there, there's a lot of evidence that shows that, that we should have some species that survive pretty much anything we can throw at them. But coral reefs are like probably not going to make it. Like that's the truth. Um, and so I think that if we can save some of it, that's better than none of it. It's kind of like a, I completely, I completely agree with you. Like the other thing is like the vast majority of restoration efforts focus on autotrophic species because they grow faster. They're kind of like targeting the fastest growing ones to like restore as quickly as possible. Um, but in those cases, you also lose kind of that functional diversity. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very good question. That answer. Yeah. So it, it seems like it's a bit, I mean, this just came to me with this, with this dialogue. I mean, it seems like it would be a really bad strategy to try to regenerate your reef using fast growing autotrophs because they're the ones that are most likely susceptible to kind of yeah. weakening of this, right? I mean, yeah. is this something that's known? Is this being implemented? Yeah, like, so I, I think like there's a disconnect between, there's a lag, right, in the science and like the conservation effort. Yeah. yeah, like a lot of these, so a lot of the organizations that are doing these restoration efforts. You know, some of them are NGOs, but some of them are kind of like uh, philanthropic branches of companies. Um, and I think that short term with fast growing corals, you can demonstrate great results, right? You're like, look, look at these pictures where they got really big and like, look at all the research restored. But it's like, it's definitely sh like there's this short term thinking, right? And so like, you know, I mean, this my the paper that um, I presented came out in 2020, so it's relatively recent. Um, but there was evidence before, you know, that kind of like branching species and fast branching species are more susceptible and less resilient. Um, but I think like really translating that message to conservation action, it's getting kind of it's, it's slow and it's getting like caught up. Yeah, this is something that actually my lab in Hong Kong is pushing hard. So like we've got they've gotten some contracts from the government to restore corals in Hong Kong, um, and I think that they have kind of put a lot of effort into, okay, we'll do the fast growing ones, but we'll also do these like slow growing heterotrophic ones um, to kind of like keep the reef diverse, but also, you know, ensure, Hong Kong is a little bit of a special place because you don't see a lot of bleaching there yet. It's subtropical, but it could be coming. You know, it's, we started to see it a little. So yeah, it's good to plan for those kinds of potentialities. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm so in, in just seeing your presentation, it's like, wow, the heterotrophic ones seem like they're resistant to bleaching or they'll bleach, but they don't die. But it sounds like in in nature, they're dying too with these yeah. events. So it's not really as positive a story as I was. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not like, guys, you can see it reef. Like we figured it out. It's more like we can buy them all the time. Mm -hmm. Because, <laughs> because like, so I think what's particularly telling is the figure I showed with mortality and soil cover loss, right? So the, the autotrophs are like, if you have a bleaching event come through, way more of them are dying and you're losing your more coral cover. So, but the, the heterotrophs, like, you know, they're, at least some of them are sticking around. Like some are dying, but like a big proportion of them are sticking around. And so, and it all has to do with the magnitude of the, the thermal stress and the duration, right? So like we know that it's going to keep getting worse at least for like the next decade or two, right? It's, so like, can we find species that can persist through what's coming while we try to like mitigate the root of the problem, which is obviously way more complicated, but like fundamentally what has to change, right? We have to change greenhouse gas Yeah. 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 <laughs> I hear someone else left. It's okay. it, yeah. I, I was just going to ask if, it, if people have been successful in repropagating uh, bleach colonies with the desire. Oh, wow. That's a great question. So, like in nature, if you have a, okay, so sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat for the Zoom. The question was have people been successful at kind of like uh, reinfecting, well, reinfecting a bleach colony with the myon? So, the short answer is yes. So in the lab, we can like make a coral bleach using other ways and then like give them whatever symbiote we want to study and like do experiments with them. Um, and in nature, corals that bleach can get new symbionts if like the temperature decreases. So if the stress is relieved, a bleached coral can basically like 
or horizontally transmitted symbionts in the environment and recover and survive. That's how they survive. Um, in terms of like applying this to conservation, I don't think that there's any, so like there's been a lot of kind of, uh, like there's some, there's a good body of work that shows that certain genera of the symbiotes in EAC are more thermally resistant than others. So certain algae can like resist temperature. So there's been like a lot of ideas of like, can we get corals to associate with those algae? And it seems like maybe, like it's very difficult to control this in nature, right? So we could like seed corals with those algae and then put them in the reef and then you come back and you sample them and they're associating with something else, right? Like it's like, well, that didn't work. Yeah, like, they have to switch on this. They, yeah. They have historically an association with the reef on it or something, I think. Yeah. So, so like, this is also kind of like rel either relatively new. So there used to be this idea that like each coral colony associated with like one type of algae, but that turns out to be false. So there's like one dominant strain of algae, but then there's always like background, there's other strains present in the colony. And so like, yeah, like we have like, when we try to do experiments where we manipulate the algal associations, you have to be really careful because if, so if they get exposed to like an algae they like better, they'll just like, that'll become the dominant one. Like you have to kind of keep them separate and sterile. And, so it's like, we want, it's like, we're like, yeah, we can control this, but like, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> we can under like very controlled conditions. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yes. Yeah, I was again thinking about these gradients between facets that they find obligated uh, in biomes. And I was thinking about the evolutionary history of these corals. Is there something that shows that they were um, not mutualists and then they became mutualists, you know, or they were always mutualists and then they became like cheaters of the mutualism? Or is there no pattern there? Okay, so the question is I'm repeating for the Zen people. Sorry, Zen people. I haven't been good at this. Um, the question is like in the evolution of corals, did they start as like obligate or like no mutualisms and then like some of them lost it yeah like where is the change to love the mutualism and became more right. or to become right like right. How, how is that in the evolutionary history of that so it's kind of like did they start off kind of like more heterotrophic or more autotrophic and like which traits they lose or maybe there's no pattern that I, I was wondering if there's a pattern there. People study this. I know that this is the thing that there are papers on. I don't know the answer to your question off the top of my head. There are a lot of corals that just don't associate with the bed and AC alive today. Um, but which which state is kind of like ancestral, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if like we're dealing with like the corals that exist today are all from a ancestor that had a symbiosis. I don't know. That's a great I should, I should know. <laughs> Is there, have you checked to see if any questions came through the chat? Um, I've been keeping an eye on it. I haven't seen anything, but I'm not sure if it's because. Uh, let's see. Like. Okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. There's more. Sorry. Sorry. There's a little. Oh, okay, good. Great. Okay, no questions on the Zoom. I'm so happy that I wasn't neglecting you. Um, we do have a question here. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. This is. Oh, boy. First of his time. Yeah. Okay. So, how is it separate isotopic signatures for the host of Semaya? Oh, this is a great question. So, um, we basically like harvest the coral tissue with a like a spray gun, like a spray painting gun. Um, and then you can centrifuge, you, you like homogenize the blurry <laughs> um, with like a tissue tear. So you have to rip open the host cells essentially, right? Because the symbionts are inside. And then you can use a series of centrifugations where the algal cells are more dense. So you get this really nice, distinct, dark green, beautiful, sometimes brown pellet at the bottom of your tube. So this, and you can like do some cleaning steps, to, like make sure they're pretty pure. And then uh, you dry them and and still isotope analysis is like pretty it's pretty nice because you need a very small amount of tissue and you just like basically need it to be dry then you get data 
So yeah, that's a that's, <laughs> like, that's a good question. Expression if there's time. I think maybe this is maybe you can talk with Brian about expression. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's probably time that we <laughs> thank you for your finish the close. But what a fantastic talk. Oh, that's thank you so much. Oh, it's for five minutes. Oh, thank you.